Okay, so hello everybody. I am Professor Uzi Rabi, Director of the Moshe Dayan Center for Middle Eastern African Studies in Tel Aviv University. And it is my distinct uh, privilege and uh, pleasure to welcome you all to the Gandal Annual Symposium at Tel Aviv University. Let me say some words about the symposium as this has become part and parcel of our tradition in the university. The Gandalf Symposium is one of the most popular events in the framework of TAU International Board of Governors meeting. And uh, we are doing that, of course, on an annual basis. Uh, it offers TAU governors, uh, I would say, the unique opportunity to gain what we call first-hand impression uh, from Middle East experts, uh, on major events and forces that shape our ever-changing region. The year 2020 has been a very dramatic one. A tumultuous change is sweeping the region. And basically this is what we are trying to come up with uh, today. It gives me a real pleasure to introduce Mr. John Gandals of Melbourne. Australia. John has been a stalwart supporter of Israel, a passionate Zionist, and a true friend of Tel Aviv University. I can tell from what I know actually that John has been so instrumental in contributing his time and resources in support of so many institutions in Israel, Jewish education, Holocaust remembrance, as well as furthering actually education here in the, state, in the state of Israel, everywhere. So let me thank you, John, for everything you have done and continue to do. And you are uh, basically an inspiration to us all. We want you to know that. And without further ado, let's just say some words about the panel. And then Mr. Gandal is going to introduce the speakers. Our panel today, will be dealing with what I would uh, depict as the changing political and security architecture in, uh, in our region, in the Middle East. And of course, when it comes in the shadow of the coronavirus pandemic, all the more reason why we should come up with some That's insights the regarding that. Uh, as always, we have gathered some outstanding uh, speakers today uh, to share actually their thoughts and our thoughts with you on this issue and on kind of a, a broader panorama of the Middle East. So without further ado, let me uh, uh, ask Mr. John Gandal to introduce the speaker. John, please. Thank you, Uzi. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and our many friends in Israel and around the world. Greetings from Melbourne, Australia, a long way away. As you might know, Melbourne is in a lockdown situation due to COVID-19, nightly curfew and travel restrictions, but our numbers are gradually falling, so there is light at the end of the tunnel. I understand from the news that after your early successful response, the situation in Israel is deteriorating and we hope and wish that you are able to overcome the renewed outbreak quickly and effectively. I welcome everyone to this virtual Gandal Symposium, the first ever held in this format. As you heard, my name is John Gandal and I'm one of the governors of Tel Aviv University. My wife and I and our extended family have been supporters of the Tel Aviv University for many years, and we are very, very proud to lend our name to this prestigious symposium. I have been given the honor and privilege of introducing today's distinguished speakers, Mr. Galuna, Dr. Sima Shine, and Professor Uzi Ravi, who you've just heard. I will introduce each one before they speak, and as we are on a tight schedule, let me start right away. Here are a few words of introduction about Mr. Una. 
Mr. Yigal Una is the Director General of Israel National Cyber Director of INCD, speaking on cybersecurity in pandemic times. Mr. Una previously served as Chief Executive Director of the Director of Cyber Technology Unit in the INCD. He has over three decades of experience in the Israeli security system. He worked in signals intelligence or SIGINT and cyber related positions combining intelligence, R&D and operations together with policy and capacity building. Among many roles he held, he also served as head of SIGINT cyber division in the Israeli security agency Shin Bet, directly under the Director General. After 22 years of service with Israel Security Agency, Mr. Una joined the National Cyber Directorate, where he was tasked with setting up the National Cyber Bureau's Cyber Technology Unit, as well as leading it until his appointment as head of the Unified Directorate back in December of 2017. Mr. Una is an alumni of Unit 8200. He holds an MBA and a BA in History and Management both from Tel Aviv University. And before I hand over to Mr. Una Egal, if I may, just a couple of reflections on his public comments over the years. Egal, you once famously said that, and I quote, passwords should be treated like underwear, changed often and never shared. I believe that caused a little bit of excitement at the time. But your job is definitely far from being about jokes and passwords. It's about the future of Israel, about its national security. It is indeed about life and death for the Jewish people. One just has to reflect on one of the recent serious incidents with the suspected Iranian cyber attack on the water facility in Israel. It is no surprise that Egal stated in a recent report that a cyber winter is coming. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we're in for an engaging and thought provoking presentation. Egal, over to you. Uh, John, thank you very much. And thank you everybody for, for having me. This is a great privilege to, 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 to be here in this uh, distinguished forum. Uh, <clears throat> well, as you mentioned, uh, cyber is everywhere. And I may begin with uh, what happened just last week. I had, uh, the great honor to uh, be part of the historic delegation of the Israeli uh, senior ex executives, first time ever publicly uh, to Abu Dhabi, to the United Arab Emirates, as a part of the uh, joint American-Israeli delegation, uh, working, beginning to pave the way with the UAE to a new age. And uh, I have uh, in my, uh, I had in, my, in the de delegation sitting next to me, the supervisor of the banking in Israel, I had the CEO of the healthcare services and many other civilian agencies. And uh, I was almost the only uh, security representative uh, in this uh, delegation, but it's, not, uh, it's no wonder because everything today, any bridge that we want to build and we want to, to, to connect people and countries uh, must be uh, secured by design from the early stages in order to make sure that it will work. And this is uh, uh, not new to us and not new to the uh, UAEs. And that's why I joined the, the first uh, delegation and we began and I met uh, with a, a, a like-minded and a, a very highly professional uh, colleagues over there looking forward for working together with Israel, as Israel has some merits, let's say uh, modestly, in the cybersecurity uh, nationwide and industry-wise. Uh, so we have uh, uh, these uh, merits, but why we need these merits? And I was asked there, as I asked many times, why Israel is, is, uh, uh, is excelling in cybersecurity? Well, what, what you do you need to be uh, pretty good in cybersecurity? Well, first, let's talk about cyber and cybersecurity. Cyber is the, uh, a, a nickname for all the dark side 
all the abuse uh, that can be uh, or is done, unfortunately, to the digital measures. So there was no cyber 12 years ago, 15 years ago, as uh, the internet was premature. As the internet grew up and the digital life, mobile phones, etc., grew rapidly, then we saw every time there's a good thing in the in humankind, the, the dark side, the abuse uh, of, of these uh, elements are also growing. And unfortunately, many times, even faster than the good and, and, uh, and meritable uh, measures. And we see that in cyber or in, in digital, in the internet, the, the uh, race and the, and the pace and the speed it works mostly for the bad guys because when Microsoft and any other big software company and small software companies issue a new program, a new service, cloud, artificial intelligence, whatever, immediately the bad guys begin to, to, uh, to rattle it and to find the uh, weak spots, the soft belly of any new technology and they'll find it because everything that is done by humans, by people, is bound to be with flaws. That's how we are wired, unfortunately or fortunately, uh, until the robots will replace us, and that's a different discussion. Uh, we need all the time to, to be aware of that. So whenever we get the, the, the most modern and most uh, sophisticated computer or mobile phone or gadget, we should be aware and understand that the, the devil is already inside. It, maybe nobody meant that it will be, but the flaws, the cracks, the holes, the vulnerabilities out there. So how we deal with that and what will be the end? Because we, we want to use technology, we want to harness technology and data technology to our uh, needs and to our benefits. And it's, we should do. So, as we uh, uh, develop and we move forward toward more digitalization, we need to take care and build a strong uh, legs, strong uh, bedrock of, of security. And how to secure that? Well, that's elusive. In Israel, we began a little earlier than the others. The, the good news for Israel, for my uh, uh, profession, is what used to be only an uh, Israel problem and uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Rabbi here can, can uh, elaborate on that. He knows about the, the Middle East conflicts and the Israeli-Arab, uh, Israeli, etc. conflicts uh, along the uh, more than 100 years. Well, we still have them in different shapes. Used to be Sunnah, now it's more Shiite and, and others. But now the, the problems are not only Israel or Middle East or Israeli something conflicts because the digitalization is worldwide. So when uh, uh, Israel fought it, it, it battles and fights, now the rest of the world join over because now everyone is exposed to the same problems, the same uh, threats that Israel by itself only isolated was exposed until recently, until a decade ago or, or a little more than a decade ago. So when Israel on the evolutionary side, we needed to, to build strong security measures, counter terrorism, counter everything, or counter all the threats to just to survive in this tough neighborhood. We also built a strong, what we have in, in a, a, a cheaper and easier than other national or, or natural resources, sorry, uh, that we don't have, we have good minds and, and uh, youngsters and good education and uh, Tel Aviv University is one of the, the greatest symbols of that. Uh, as I as was mentioned, I was, uh, uh, got my degrees over there. So we relied on our minds and our uh, uh, IQ and uh, intellect to build strong security measures. When the uh, data revolution hit the world, Israel was one uh, uh, step ahead or one a uh, couple of feet above the tsunami wave. And that goes with the technology and the uh, security of this technology. So we just see what hit Israel is now hitting everywhere. And since the COVID-19 case, uh, uh, 
uh, outbreak. Um, just five or six months ago, all the world suffers from the same problem with the growing numbers. And when I say suffer, it's it's a, a cannot uh, be easy to describe how the explosion of cyber attacks we we now uh, uh, suffer not just in Israel but all around the world grow up rapidly. Why? Because of two major things. First, all the the, the all the world went to work remotely. Uh, uh, schools. Uh, spread out and, and uh, uh, universities and of course uh, corporates and, and governments went to work at home remotely and even when we began to, to come back it's not completely we still have 30 percent 50 percent working from home so that's what we call attack surface and immediately we spread the attack surface from just you know close fortresses of corporates of, of uh, government agencies now it's getting to the homes of all the employees all around. And that's a heaven for hackers, for the bad guys to try to hack and to attack in the soft belly, in the desktop or laptop at uh, uh, one's home. And through that to get to infiltrate into the uh, holy grail and the, to get the crown jewels of the corporate, of the government, of the agency. And the second thing, is as I mentioned, all the schools, all the high schools and, and the preliminary schools and, and university uh, uh, were closed. All the youngsters went home. So those who not already been hacking and working in the cyber things, some of them got to, you know, just uh, gaming and having fun with the computers and others, millions all around the world, say, hey, let's try this and try that and try to hack. And what, let's see what we can do with this uh, computer things and the thing that we read or we saw that our friends are doing. And so immediately we got a, 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 this amount of volume, large volume of uh, uh, hackers, not uh, too sophisticated at the beginning, but uh, uh, when you see this kind of waves of tsunami wave, some of it, a lot of it, hits and get into the uh, where it shouldn't get. And that's the two major factors that we still suffer. And when I say winter is coming, I said that way before the, the, the COVID-19 case uh, came into, into our lives. But uh, we see we're getting more and more vulnerable on the one hand. And the bad guys all around the world are getting larger, more sophisticated in volume, in, in, in everything. And uh, as we are getting more digitalized, we want to get more high, high level of technology, then we are more exposed. Now, Israel, when I, I, I began to, with describing the, the uh, working with the uh, UAE, today Israel have more than 90 countries, nine zero countries that we work very closely on cybersecurity. Because this is another uh, thing about cyber that we should uh, uh, remember. Not a single agency or a single country, not as big as Australia and not even big as the US, can handle this problem alone. Why? Because of the nature of the internet. That's the beauty of it. And again, whenever you see something that you say, wow, how technologically impressive it is, remember, this is what we look, the cybersecurity community, and say, oh my God, that's a, it's a nightmare. As high level of technology it gets, the more nightmare of cybersecurity it is. So when we see uh, the, the internet and the technology goes worldwide and, and cloud computing and AI and everything and quantum computing, then we, we understand that not a single, even superpowers must work with others to, in order to defend themselves. Because if they just stand at the door and hope that they can push back the hackers and the attacks just by standing at the doorstep. They failed already. You need, in order to, to defend Israel, I need to go as far as Australia, India, uh, Latin America, all worldwide, because the attackers don't come from uh, the Palestinian Authority. Some of them are, but most of them worldwide. And they go in order to hide themselves and to, to avoid getting captured, they go through India or Spain or Portugal or Italy or all of the above. 
So we must work together in order to detect and to prevent in advance any kind of attack. We need to, to work together and to partner. And I began and uh, I will finish with the, uh, the UAE example as we about to sign uh, the historic uh, uh, treaty next week in Washington. Uh, cyber is just the obvious, one of the first step of building these bridges because the partnership is understood as, as a need, not a nice to have, a need to have in both sides in order to, to strengthen ourselves and get stronger and, and, and more robust against anyone that will may try to, to foil or to, to disrupt the, this uh, uh, peace festival. And uh, we work with them and the Israeli industry that I, I, and I explained why it grew so strong uh, in cyber security and other measures of security, but cyber is data and uh, intellect and understanding of security. Merge these uh, uh, things together and you get a strong fist that small Israel uh, but small but strong Israel can provide and can give the world and we try to do that to all our like-minded friends and all our like-minded uh, partners and we're seeking for more partnerships and that's, we'll, I'll finish with that, we, we're uh, uh, putting our hands and, and say whoever wants to, to, to partner with Israel or the Israeli industry, we can get the connections come over and of course with the Israeli academia and we have a strong cyber research center in, in Tel Aviv University that we're uh, very glad and very proud to be a part of it, we funding it and we see a lot of, of outcomes, great researchers, a, a great reputation, a academic global reputation coming from this uh, center and we, you should all, we should all be proud of that and put more efforts because as I said, winter is coming and we need to, to get ready for that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Egal. Thank you. That was very, 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 very fascinating and very, very simply and clearly put, which makes a big difference to lay people like ourselves. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I have the pleasure of introducing our next presenter, Dr. Sima Shine, speaking on Iran's nuclear program. Dr. Shine is a senior research fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies, INSS, of Tel Aviv University, where she heads up the Iran pro program. For most of her career, Dr. Shine served in the Israeli intelligence community. Her last position was head of the research and evaluation division of Mossad from 2003 to 2007. I understand that was the highest position held by a woman in Mossad at that time. Dr. Shine was in charge of ongoing evaluations on Middle Eastern and international issues. She led security and intelligence dialogues and was involved in political military meetings with decision makers. After her retirement from the Mossad, she served as deputy head of strategic affairs in Israel's National Security Council and then served in the Israeli Ministry of Strategic Affairs for around seven years, where she was Deputy Director General and in charge of the Iran file. Dr. Shine holds an MA in Political Science and Security Studies, a BA in Middle East Studies, and is a graduate of the National Security College. These days, Dr. Shine is very active in the public arena as well, with regular commentary in the media, such as the Jerusalem Post, online appearances, and opinion articles published in web and print media out outlets. Dr. Shine provides important background and commentary on the situation with Iran. And recently she added that, I quote, the most important issue for the international community to deal with is the regional policy in Iran. Dr. Shine, Seema, if I may, I understand that back in 2015, you were one of the beacon lighters at the opening of the Independence Day ceremonies on Mount Herzl, an incredible honor and entirely deserved. To hear insights from Dr. Shine on the challenge of the corona effect in the Middle East, I will now hand over to Dr. Shine Seema. Seema, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, John, and I'm very happy to be here with you and uh, 
thanks for inviting me. Just a small correction, you know, we are we in the Mossad are very accurate with all the details. I'm not a doctor. I'm perhaps smart like a doctor, but I am not. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm just a MA and um, I didn't have enough time to do uh, to have also the PhD. So thank you very much and let me, uh, I was asked to talk about the nuclear program of Iran and uh, I think it's a, it is a major issue in Israel as you know, but not only, it's, region, it's a very, region, very important regional issue part of what was mentioned before by Eagle, the background of the relations between Israel and the UAE probably was part, big part of that was connected to Iran. Um, and then of course, first and foremost, uh, the nuclear issue. Uh, so let me say, where, let me start by saying where we stand today, then some words about the concerns of Israel uh, and some words about the prospects for the coming year. So we are today two years after the Trump, more than two years after the Trump administration decided to leave the agreement. And one year, more than one year, since Iran decided um, to uh, gradually uh, get out of some of the major and more important clauses of the agreement. Um, it took a time because the Iranian star in the first year were hesitating to do it and then uh, they decided to um, to break the equation that was uh, on one hand Iran's uh, a nuclear program rolling rolling back and on the other side sanctions relief and they uh, and when uh, after a year they saw that the sanctions are becoming uh, uh, biting more and more, they decided to start also to erode the agreement. What we, uh, where we stand today, we just had uh, some days ago the last report of, of the IAEA, so we know better uh, uh, from open sources what is the uh, uh, situation of the nuclear program. And uh, let me just mention three, four points that are very uh, important. Uh, just to understand the, uh, where we stand vis-a-vis um, -vis and what and that will implicate, of course, uh, for, for the future. So we, Iran, according to this report, has more than 2,000 kilograms of uh, fissile material. According to the JCPOA, the agreement, she, uh, it could uh, have only 300. It has more than 2,000 today. In brackets, 2,000, more than what they have today could be enough to enrich uh, more than two uh, nuclear devices once they decide to do it. Iran is enriching to a higher degree than it was uh, allowed in the agreement. Not very high still, but uh, higher. Iran uh, was, uh, according to, agree to the agreement, was allowed to enrich only in one uh, place, Natanz called, and now they are enriching in two places. One of them was not uh, operating in the, la in the years of the agreement. In previous years. And uh, Iran is, uh, has changed the schedule of uh, R&D on the um, more advanced centrifuge. Uh, everybody understood that it, this was a big leap, uh, a loophole in the uh, agreement and therefore the agreement itself has put, um, let's say, a timetable on a, a very long timetable on Iran's uh, R&D and what it could have done according to the agreement, the Iranians, once they decided to get out, without proclaiming that they are out, uh, are doing it in a, in a more, in a speediest way. And in brackets, I would say, I don't know uh, who did the, uh, the, ex the explosion in the uh, 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 site of the mo most uh, advanced centrifuge, but the one who did it uh, probably has uh, change the timeline of uh, uh, bringing the, uh, this uh, centrifuge into operation, operational uh, status uh, than it was planned from the beginning. Now, the main, everything I have said, the main conclusion of that and the main importance of that is what we have been talking so much about, the breakout time to a bomb if they decide to do it. Uh, 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 once Iran was in the agreement, it was around a year. Uh, today, uh, our estimation is that it is around four months. Uh, I emphasize if Iran decides to do it, and I'll say a word about that in the, uh, in, 
now uh, in the coming minutes. Uh, so what I'm saying, um, what I'm saying, if Iran decides, uh, of course, there is a question of why, what Iran wants to do with this project. Uh, we know, and we knew it many years ago, uh, that Iran wanted to reach a military nuclear capability. There was no question in Israel about that. It took some time for the international community to agree to that. But today, two years after the Mossad has brought part of the nuclear archive, uh, of Iran, we know from this archive that the leader, as the directive of the leader to the, scienti the, the, the program and the scientists that were working on the program, the directive uh, was five, uh, that, and what I'm talking about is 2003-2004, not 2020. So probably today he would say something else, but at that time he asked them to be able to prepare five nuclear devices. Now we know from, uh, from the past, but also from the archive, that Iran knows how to prepare a, a, a device and knows also how to have a warhead on a missile. And the missile program, which is the delivery system, is very uh, developed in Iran. So when, you, uh, uh, when we look on, on, on the options that are, that are standing before Iran, if it wants to, dec to decide on what way to, to walk, there are two, two big models in the, in the world. One is the, called the uh, uh, Japanese model. The other one is the North Korean model. The Japanese model means uh, being a threshold nuclear state very, very close, having all the components and being very close to, uh, to, uh, to once there is a, a political decision to have some nuclear devices, to be very close in a matter of weeks uh, to be able to have it. And the other one is the North Korean one that, uh, as you all know, have exp expelled the IAE inspectors and rushed to, to a bomb, have made several uh, nuclear tests and has proclaimed openly to everyone that they have this capability. Iran, until today, has decided to go in the path of the Japanese model, meaning doing everything uh, from the Iranian point of view under the cover of, the, of a civilian project, but, be, but bringing itself to, a, to, a, to the threshold in a situation where they can decide if and when, if the circumstances allow, if the leader decides, decides that it's important. Now, if Iran decides to go the, the North Korean model, they have, I would say, uh, meaning to get to a nuclear device and to have also a test that proclaims to all everyone that they have the capability and have, probably have more than one because you don't, proclaim openly if you have only one device, probably more than that. If they decide to go in this direction, I would say they have generally two major um, ways to do it. One is um, like North Korea, meaning uh, breaking uh, all the rules of the game, uh, expelling the, the uh, inspectors and rushing uh, to uh, fulfill the, the plan. The other one, and I personally believe Iran would prefer to go on the other one, is uh, to do most of the way in a secret site without anyone knowing it and only very close to the point where they think that they can uh, break out uh, to uh, uh, get out uh, openly. Now, uh, this is what the Iranians have, have done in the last years and where they stand today. Uh, on the other side, we have the US. Uh, Trump decided uh, to uh, bring back sanctions and to have what he is calling the maximum pressure policy. This maximum pressure policy was very successful in bringing in Ir Iran to a very, very severe economic situation. On all parameters that you, are, you can uh, look on Iran, uh, the uh, severe situation, the, the, the Iranian market is in a very severe situation. Where it is uh, related to the high inflation rates, to the unemployment, very high unemployment, specific, especially within the uh, young generation, educated young, young generation. Uh, the uh, currency vis-a-vis -vis the dollar is in uh, levels we didn't know before. 
uh, Iran's uh, demands uh, from the international uh, law uh, to get loans from the international uh, monetary fund uh, were not uh, uh, were or were were negatively uh, answered, um, partially because of the U.S. And uh, of course, we, we had to if we add to that the uh, low prices of oil, even what Iran is uh, able to smuggle is in very low prices. Uh, and we, if we add to this, uh, con uh, this severe economic situation also the coronavirus and Iran is uh, in, in the highest numbers in the Middle East. Um, and of course, the, uh, the assassination of uh, Qasem Soleimani, the, uh, the uh, tragic event they had with the Ukraine uh, airplane, and also uh, the demonstrations that we see in Iraq and in Lebanon, that part of them includes also demands uh, for uh, Iran to get out and to lower its influence, as well as, uh, as its own uh, uh, friends, Hezbollah and the Shia militias in, in Iraq. So all this together uh, puts Iran really in a very severe situation. But in spite of all of that, what is interesting is that Iran still continues to refuse to come to the negotiating table that uh, Trump's, Trump asked them to, to come to. Um, from their point of view, from this point of view, I would say the maximum pressure policy did not succeed because on one hand it succeeded very much in bringing the uh, in, uh, Iranian economic situation to very low levels, but at the same time it did not succeed with the main aim of this uh, policy and to bring Iran to negotiate a better agreement for a longer time and in a better, a better terms. Now, uh, um, we are, uh, the main question is what is coming up, what will come up in the coming year? Uh, we are uh, less than two months from the elections in the US. No question that it, this is a major develop, could be a major development, is a major and could be. And Iran, in spite of the fact that publicly we hear all the high level uh, as well as the leader saying that they, don't care actually if it is Trump or Biden because the Americans cannot be trusted and what they what they want this way or the other they want a regime change but we know that part of their behavior and the constraint that they have put on themselves uh, is in order to see what happens in these elections and they do have um, a hope even though it might be very difficult, that once there is a different administration in uh, Washington, perhaps they will be able to get to any kind of uh, understandings that will also enable relief of, uh, of sanctions. Uh, but uh, if Trump uh, is elected and four years more are for the Iranians to be on the maximum pressure policy, there is a big question whether Iran can stand uh, more four years of such uh, sanctions. What Israel is bothered, what concerns Israel? Uh, there are three uh, scenarios, main three scenarios, and each of them has this or other kind of a problem for Israel. The first one is if Iran decides to continue with its uh, uh, nuclear program and to continue to uh, handle uh, sanctions and uh, even though it's very difficult, but not to give in on any of the demands and slowly but surely getting to a threshold nuclear threshold country that is able to uh, be in a very short time uh, from a nuclear a military nuclear device. The question for Israel will be at that time, who sits in the, the, the one who sits in the White House and it relates to Trump as well as to Biden, whether he will be willing to use the, uh, the uh, uh, military option, to use or to threaten, I would say, because threatening will be, might be enough in the case of Iran, threatening with a military option. The second scenario is if Trump's, Trump continues to a second term, uh, whether the Iranians will, and the Iranians will decide that they cannot stand for more economic uh, sanctions, and they will go back to negotiations. From Israel's point of view, what will be very important is to see 
that Trump will not be uh, satisfied with the photo opportunity and the uh, um, willingness of Iran to make this or other gestures uh, and the, uh, because the list of the demands that we think that should be put before Iran is a very long one and it is not concerned only with the nuclear issue, it's also with re uh, regional uh, issues. So we don't know uh, to be sure uh, because it looks the way Trump, if we're looking on the way Trump was handling the North Korean case, there might be a situation where he decides to have a very, very immediate, very short and immediate achievement with the Iranians without going into all the details. And I want to remind you that the previous agreement took two years to get to that. And the third and the last uh, scenario, if ba Biden is the next president, and he has already um, uh, declared that he wants to go back to the JCPOA, uh, and we know, and we are talking to people that are around the advisors that are around uh, uh, Biden, and we know that they are thinking, how can they do it? How can they come back to any kind of negotiations? And the question at that time will be whether Israel will be consulted, whether we will be part of that, which is very, very important. Uh, and whether the uh, Biden administration will be able and will know how to use the very difficult economic situation that Iran is, is having today in order to achieve maximum, uh, the, uh, maximum achievements on the nuclear as well as uh, on the uh, regional. So to summarize my uh, presentation, I want to say that the coming year is going to be a very important year. It includes uh, several different scenarios that I cannot say which of them will be uh, in two or three or four months because the new administration, if it's a new administration, it comes into the White House only in January. And most of these scenarios are uh, very challenging for Israel. Thank you. Thank you, Sim. That was uh, fascinating and very, very enlightening. Um, unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. So I'd just like to throw one point at you that maybe one day will come out, that's the question of the China syndrome. What's, what's happening with this latest commercial arrangement that China has set up with Iran? Mm -hmm. That's very menacing for Israel from, from my point of view, but not to discuss now. I'm sorry to bring, bring that into it and waste the time. Um, Seema, thank you very much. That was really very, very enlightening. And uh, I'm sorry you're not a doctor. Uh, I also studied to be a doctor and I didn't become one because I wasn't clever enough. Uh, lucky the Tel Aviv University had sympathy on me and gave me an honorary doctorate some years later. So at least I nearly got there. So we're both in the same boat. Thank you. And now for our final presenter at the 2020 Gandal Symposium, I'm pleased to say a few words about Professor Uzi Rabi, who you heard before, who will speak on the Corona effect in the Middle East. Professor Rabi is currently the director of the Moisha Dayan Center for Middle East and African Studies, and is also a senior researcher at the Center for Iranian Studies. Before that, he was the head of the Department of Middle East and African History at Tel Aviv University. Professor Rabi's research focuses on the modern history and evolution of states and societies in the Persian Gulf, the Iranian-Arab relations, oil and politics in the Middle East, and Sunni Shia dynamics. In this context, Professor Rabi has supervised the dis dissertations of numerous doctoral candidates in these fields over many years. Professor Rabi is invited to the Knesset and other governmental forums on a regular basis to provide briefings and lectures on matters of national and regional importance. He delivers lectures in both academic and non-academic forums on a regular basis during Operation Protective Edge. Professor Rabi was a regular and familiar face in both Israeli and international media. Professor Rabi is a published author as well, and in his book, The Return of the Past, he argued that the Arab Spring brought to the forefront numerous societal, political, and historical problems in the Middle East that have continually been glossed over. 
As a result, he asserted that, I quote, primordial identities, including religion, sect, and tribe, have and will continue to have a significant impact on the conduct of politics in the Middle East. I tend to agree with that analysis. Ladies and gentlemen, can I hand over to Professor Rabi? Well, thanks, John, for that uh, generous introduction. Um, uh, hello again, everybody. And uh, well, let's just uh, see what this uh, panorama of the Middle East actually was to get in recent years, especially in 2020. Basically, what we are experiencing in the Middle East is a tumultuous change. It is a real drama. You know, at times we think together here in Tel Aviv University, how you're going to teach actually Middle Eastern studies in view of what's going on. And there's a lot to do. But uh, of course, on top of uh, the other things, what we got in 2020 is this coronavirus. And COVID-19 actually served to intensify or accelerate some of the already existing processes that the region has, uh, has experienced. So let me just uh, come up with, uh, I would say, uh, three dimensions to my presentation, maybe three main observations. The first of which would be uh, what I would call the ruler-ruled relationship in the Middle East. This is very, very important to understand that when it comes to the bad guys, and let me use that depiction, Iran and company, uh, you can just include Turkey, Hamas, Hezbollah, etc. Well, they, like others, basically, tried in the first place to entertain themselves with the idea that uh, they could get rid of the virus uh, with people not noticing actually what's going on. Of course, this was not true. The opposite actually occurred because in some states where problems were in abundance, let's name them, we do depict them as failed states in the Middle East. It's Yemen, it's uh, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Iran as Shima, Sima Shine actually just uh, 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 mentioned. I mean, these states were uh, basically in the midst of a real, real uh, a trauma, socio-politically, socio-economically, socio-demographically. So in such cases, leaders tried actually to bring in some other topics as to divert the attention of the population from what was to go on. In the final analysis, while looking at Iran, while looking at Lebanon, protests were there before. But what the coronavirus has managed to do, quote unquote, in such states is, as I said before, to intensify the already existing problems. And this was to, I would say, uh, be very problematic when it comes to the, uh, let's say, ruler ruled equation. Uh, if we can see actually this uh, once again, you would see Hamas, for example, is trying actually to use the COVID-19 as something by which, you know, this is a, sort of a classical anti-Semitic usage. What is written there, uh, up there, is al virus al akhtar al al-Bashariya, which means this is the most dangerous uh, virus that has ever been actually uh, here in the world. And uh, it is basically kind of a Zionist virus or the Magen David here is uh, trying to tell you that Hamas and company try to capitalize on coronavirus as if somebody has been exported it to the Palestinians and others. But soon it became clear that this is not the case. Look at that, this is uh, downstairs there. This is uh, the, uh, what we call the uh, uh, WhatsApp, uh, let us say, protest in Lebanon, which means that, uh, as we said before, you know, dire economic conditions, people haven't got the money and they are complaining against the government. Up there, you could see actually the gas protest in Iran in 2019. All these were to tell us that before 
coronavirus protests were there. What we're going to see uh, amidst the coronavirus uh, is uh, uh, basically the same thing, but in kind of um, a sense of intensification of stuff. And I would say that uh, when it comes to states with many, many problems, like the states I mentioned, I guess that the ruler ruled equation is going to be very, very problematic because force is going to be used more and more. And basically, we'll have to wait and see what the coming or the forthcoming decade is going to bring in. What about the other states? Anti-Iranian, anti-Turkish, let's see, uh, uh, let's put it that way. Mainly Arab states. There, what we have seen is a real change. Once again, not because of Corona. It was before. States were running kind of a different agenda in comparison to the 20th century. Let's just remind ourselves, what was the agenda in the 20th century? What were the slogans? Palestinian problem, Arab solidarity. All these things were to evaporate. Why? Because many states found themselves, especially in times of Corona, more than ever before, with kind of a need to better foster their future strategy. When it comes to states in the Gulf, when it comes to states in Africa or in the north of Africa, states were so entangled with their dire economic problems, with how to deal with the virus, that what was there before was to be accelerated, as I said, and some of the states were to speed up what I would call the notion of my state first. You know, in America, Donald Trump actually put it loud and clear, America first. When it comes to the United Arab Emirates or even Egypt or Jordan, what we got there is something that uh, is going to be uh, totally different. And what I would like actually to do here is just to make sure that you are under the impression that an agenda of which actually to better my particular interests is becoming the prevailing or the most prevailing in this, this, this Middle Eastern panorama and states are being dictated or fostering their future strategy by that. This, by the way, is something that would, against this background, actually, the peace treaty between Israel and the United Arab Emirates is going to be signed next week. Why? Because states in the Gulf are asking themselves different questions. What should I do in order to better my future? And basically what they are coming up with is something which is totally different than what used to be, as I said before, in the 20th century, my first state. Al-Urdun Awalan, Jordan Awalan, Al-Emirat Awalan, UAE Awalan, uh, or first. And this is something that you have to take into account. Now, if we can go to the other slide, please. Um, what, we got, what we got here amidst the coronavirus and all these decades of the post-Arab Spring realities, what happened in the Middle East is, uh, and I, do, I hope I won't be sound uh, too melodramatic, but in the sense of geopolitics and superpowers, what we got here is a mere revolution. You know, we do teach the Middle East in the 19th and 20th century. The West, Britain, France, whatever, United States, has been always uh, been uh, um, so instrumental. This is the first time, I dare say, that Western presence in our region is uh, very pale. United States is less penetrating, we know that. This has been seen in Obama's uh, administration. And I think that to a large extent, it is being uh, followed suit by the 
Trump as Trump's administration. And look at what I'm trying to just uh, uh, bring in here. There are newcomers, China, Russia, the whole pendulum was to take a different shape and many states has to or have to recalculate their future in accordance with the geopolitical power configurations. Add on top of that, the American Chinese competition, make sure that you know that players in the Middle East are being forced at times to take sides because China is swallowing up everything, economically speaking. Russia is in the region, is the real boss of the region. And states that were, I would say, pro-Western in nature, Gulf states, Israel, some states in North Africa, were to calibrate a little bit different strategy in order to make sure that they are not antagonizing China or Russia, but at the same time, they cannot replace the irreplaceable support of the United States. This happened in tandem with what happened in the Middle East the decade after the Arab Spring. And I guess that it would be understandable to say that 2020 took these processes into kind of the peak which is unheard of in the Middle East. So states were forced one way or the other to decide where to go and what is next regarding their future. When it comes to states like Iran and company, well, we know they always have gambled on kind of a card which says the hatred of Israel, go for Israel. In Arabic, it's muqawama. In Farsi, it's muqawamat. But this is the same thing, resistance to Israel and what Israel actually is for in the Middle East. Well, here are the news. This card was a golden card in the 20th century. I think that this observation has become very, very doubtful, something that uh, should raise some question marks, whether or not this could be something that I would lean my future strategy on. And I think that some of them are sticking to that, but when it comes to the obvious, this is something that we had had before, what happened in tandem with that is many Arab states that for years have seen Iran as their erstwhile enemy, not Israel. They found kind of a wide common denominator with Israel on the basis of my enemy's enemy can be my friend. All these states, by the way, in the Gulf and even in North Africa, are states that do not identify themselves with main camps in the Middle East. The Iranian camp, Shiites, Persians, and Arabs who support them, Hezbollah, etc. The other camp is the political Islam's camp, which is headed by Recep Erdogan of Turkey. Those two camps are kind of an anathema when it comes to states like United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, I dare say Sultanate of Oman, maybe Kuwait, I don't know, Morocco and others. So here is the first thing. What happened while trying to sum up all these processes, there had been found kind of a wide common denominator between Israel and all these states. What was the logic? My enemy's enemy can be my friend. But here comes another dimension, which is more important. States were asking themselves, where should I go or how should I 
foster my future strategy, not only in the sense of regional geopolitics, which is very important, and I mentioned that, but in the sense of my national strength. What actually came to be seen is many, many, I would say, observations and insights, talks. We were talking to Arabs for 10 years, mainly Arabs from the Gulf. Actually, that was something which was uh, common wisdom. Israel is not a pariah anymore, was not a pariah. But here comes the other thing. If Israel is not a pariah, why should I prevent myself from having collaboration or cooperation with Israel, especially as Israel is a startup nation, especially as Israel is a state that in many, many ways resembles, for example, the situation of United Arab Emirates, 10 million, 10 million population, not that big territorially. I put it in understatement, of course. Why won't we come up with kind of a concerted effort to build up a mutual agenda by which to better our future for our next generations? Now, I'm not coming up with slogans, guys. This is exactly what I've been talking and the Moshe Dayan Center, which stands to argue time and again, culture matters, language matters. Talk to them in their own language. Now, I hope we are at the uh, beginning or in the beginning of something that uh, is going actually to create kind of a different atmosphere. We do talk to them 24 seven, students, researchers, exchange views, and I can tell you, they are very curious about Israel. And here is the other thing, the Palestinian problem, which was the master key for decades. And many were actually reiterating the Torah. No Arab state is going to normalize relations with Israel unless there is a full and comprehensive solution of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It was said everywhere, in Israel, in the United States, in Europe. That was kind of a dogma or a paradigm that prevented many from seeing what actually was to be seen at least in the second decade, in the last decade. Now we are not in a blame game, of course. We try to make the most of it. And here are the news. Many Arab states, took 2020 as kind of a golden opportunity to speed up something that was in their back of mind before. UAE is just a notable example. I hope that many would follow suit. And uh, to conclude my, 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 my presentation in, in kind of a, a very illustrative way, there are two scenes that are very, very, prominent in the Middle Eastern panorama. The first of which was what happened in Beirut, the explosion in the port of Beirut. You can see that down there. This is what you're gonna get if you are part and parcel of Iran and company, and you are going to let your country, Lebanon, one time Switzerland of the Middle East, you let Lebanon actually become captive under the hands of the Ayatollahs or revolutionary guards. When it comes to the population of Lebanon, so miserable, trying actually to get rescue from this octopus, but at times it seems too little, too late. At the same time, an airplane was to fly from Tel Aviv through the Saudi desert and to land in Abu Dhabi just three hours with so many hopes, 
Hopes for what? Hopes for a Middle East where people are trying actually to build up together bridges. And those bridges are, of course, have to be compiled off high tech virus uh, or vaccines for the corona, what have you. When you have the opportunity and you understand the changing reality, this is high time for both Israel and some Arab states to come together and create even partially a more, I would say, a different Middle, Middle East with a little bit more brighter future for our next generations. I'll stop here. Thank you. Uzi, thank you very much. I think you've left us with a lot of a lot to meditate on, uh, but let's hope the optimistic side of what you've been saying is what the future holds for us and for Israel. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, well, those, these, these presentations have certainly been impressive. I hope that you, just like I feel I did, have learned something new today. I hope that we now have a slightly better grasp of the topics covered, including around cybersecurity and Iran relations, especially in the context of a global viral pandemic. This event today has also confirmed to me, and I hope to all of you, the importance of having these types of forums. Personally, I think I could take another few lectures from each of the speakers here tonight because they left a lot, a lot more to talk about and uh, we shouldn't let them off the hook in future. These are indeed unique opportunities where leading minds of Israel can share their knowledge, expertise and insight on the pressing issues of today. I'm being told one of the most popular events held in the framework of Tel Aviv University Board of Governors meeting. I hope that's true, but if today, today is anything to go by, I would venture to agree, both based on the profile of the presenters and on their delivery today. Now, the annual Gandalf Symposium is, believe it or not, nearly 20 years old we will reach that milestone in just three years. Let's hope it carries on for a long time. But I hope that we do not stop there. My wife and I and our, our family are committed to supporting Tel Aviv University to be the best at what it does, to be the educational and academic institution that nurtures the future leaders, movers and shakers of not just Israel and the Middle East, but perhaps the whole world. And we hope that the Gandalf Symposium can continue being part of that mission, contributing to the excellence of learning, of research, and of academic achievement. I wish to tell, thank Tel Aviv University for organizing the virtual Gandalf Symposium. It is always worrying to try and ensure that there are no technical or logistical challenges, but being Israel, it worked out fairly well, I think, especially for an event it spans across times the time zones. So very, very well done. And to all of you, all the people in the audience, if I can call it that, thank you for watching and for listening. Have a happy and a healthy future and Shana Tova. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.